Belated Thanksgiving to those of you that are around celebrating here in Nashville. Uh, Pastor Brian is uh, up in Chicago with his family. Uh, headed back, I think it was last night, so he's probably in town this morning or on his way into town this morning. He'll be back with us next week. But in the meantime, he's asked me to, uh, to step in and... Uh, go through the word with you guys. I'm blessed to be here. Thank you for being here. We're going to be going through uh, Daniel chapter 12 this morning. This is a continuation of what I've been working through when he lets me come up here and and, uh, and speak. And so we've it's been a, over the course of a couple of years here, but we're getting into the end of Daniel chapter 12. So uh, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to be with you guys uh, learning. And let's go ahead and open up with a word of prayer and then we'll uh, we'll get started. Lord, thank you for this time that we can gather together before you. Thank you for this building that you provided for us and the safety that you've given us, Lord. And um, just thank you for the word that we get to study. I pray that you bless this time that we have together. I pray that you uh, bless the word, Lord, that your word is heard and spoken, that truth is spoken this morning, and that we receive it as a body and as a church, Lord, that we can uh, receive it and use it to glorify you. Uh, We pray those things in, uh, in your name. Amen. All right, uh, like I said, we're going to be in Daniel chapter 12. A little bit of background on Daniel just to provide some context before we get into the rest or, or really the final chapter here in Daniel. Um, Daniel was uh, brought over to Babylon in about 536 B.C. in one of the sieges of, of Jerusalem. He was brought over as a young teenager. Uh, he was about 12, 13, 14, depends on uh, how you look at it historically, but he was around that age. And he was brought into the palace of Babylon. Um, and that's really what the book of Daniel is about, at least the first part of the book of Daniel. It's about his life in the palace and the things that he did in there. And there's some amazing stories, and we've kind of worked our way through it. But the whole strategy of Babylon was to um, besiege the, the civilizations that they were trying to conquer. And then uh, once they conquered them, their strategy was to take these prisoners of war and bring them into the city of Babylon. And it was this culture of indoctrination. They were trying to impress them with the city. They were trying to impress them with the walls. They were trying to impress them with their wealth and the beauty of, of and the power of Babylon. And this is the, really the first part about Daniel is how he stayed true to his convictions within a city of indoctrination. And, and furthermore, uh, God used used him to bring glory to himself and to bring enlightenment to those around him in his uh, in his tenure at a palace. So he really worked himself up into a position of an advisor in the palace. He was seen in good light by the rulers of Babylon, um, while at the same time remaining true to his convictions. And that's really the first half of Daniel. We get a, a bunch of stories about that. And the last half of Daniel, we move into the prophetic realm, right? So the first half is history. The second half is prophecy. Generally Generally speaking, it was all prophecy for Daniel. Uh, for us, as we look back at it, some of it is fulfilled prophecy and some of it is unfulfilled prophecy. Um, and so we started in chapter 10 going over a vision, what would be the last vision that was given to Daniel. And chapter 10, 11, and 12 were all discussing the same vision. So here in chapter 12, we get a, a summation of that vision. <laughs> Excuse me, getting over a cough. So if that happens a few times, I'll try not to uh, blow out your eardrums. Uh, it, 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 here in chapter 12, we are discussing the last part of that vision, right? And so the first part, uh, chapter 10, is about the vision. Chapter 11 is about the, the interpretation of that vision. And we remember in chapter 10 that, that Daniel gets this vision and he's distressed by that vision. In fact, if we turn back there to chapter 10, verse 1... We'll get to chapter 12 eventually, I promise. Chapter 10, verse 1. It says, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a a revelation was given to Daniel, who was called Belteshazzar. Its message was true, and it concerned... A great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all until three weeks were over. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, I looked up, and there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of finest gold around his waist. His body was like chrysolite, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like a gleam of burnished bronze and his voice like the sound of a multitude and so there it is describing 
There it is describing uh, this angel that was finally sent to Daniel. And this was after 21 days. So in chapter 10, we, we really do get a glimpse of the spiritual realm. We talked about it in chapter 10. There's spiritual warfare going on that delayed this angel in giving him this interpretation. right? And this interpretation troubled Daniel. We see here, uh, as described in chapter 10, he is troubled by it. He's distressed by it. He's pale. He's shaking. He's not eating right. He's trying to figure out what's going on. And that's the same vision that we're talking about here. And so here in chapter 12, and really we're going to read the last part of chapter 11 as well, uh, we have the angel giving him the interpretation of that vision and, and, the, and uh, um, sort of summation form here in chapter 12. So we've gone over some of the details and we're going to go over them again here in chapter 12. Um, so let's dive right in. We're in. We're going to actually start in 11, uh, verse 36. Now chapter 11, as I mentioned, is mostly historic. Is mostly a, an, a historic quote unquote prophecy from our perspective, right? It's all prophecy for Daniel. When Daniel is given these words, it's all in the future. But for us, as we look at it, some of that has been fulfilled prophecy. It's really talking about two specific dynasties. It's talking about the Seleucid dynasty and the the Ptolemy dynasty, right? And these are these are the dynasties that um, became world dominating powers. And the reason they were given to Daniel and discussed in Daniel, um, one of the reasons is that they would affect Israel significantly, historically speaking. We talked about that in Daniel. The last part of Daniel, we shift from that history and from talking about those dynasties into talking about the future right and this is the future for us so to be clear we're talking about the end times this is an end times prophecy right um, and we're going to touch base on a, a lot of things in regards to the end times we see a little bit about the antichrist here we see a little bit about the tribulation and then we see how the church fits into these things right and so that's what we're going to be discussing this morning verse 36 we're going to read verses um, 36, uh, 36 through 39, and then uh, 5 through 13. Those are sort of the bookends of what we're studying, and then we're going to go through it verse by verse. Verse 36, the king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will stay unheard of and will say unheard of things against the god of gods. He will be successful in the, until the time of wrath is completed, for what has been determined must take place. He will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the one desired by women, nor will he regard any god, but will exalt himself above them all. Instead of them, he will honor a god of fortresses, a god unknown to his fathers. He will honor with gold and silver with precious stones and costly gifts he will attack the mightiest fortresses with the help of a foreign god with uh, and will greatly honor those who acknowledge him he will make them rulers over many people and will distribute the land at a price and then jump over to verse 5 of chapter 12 then i daniel looked up and there before me stood two others one on this bank of the river one on the opposite bank of the river and this is likely talking about the tigris river that he was standing on in chapter 10 that we read briefly uh, one of them said to the man clothed in linen uh, who was one of them said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river how long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river lifted his right hand and his left hand toward the heaven and I heard him swear by him who lives forever, saying, It will be for a time, times, and half a time. When the power of the holy people has been finally broken, all these things will be completed. I heard, but I did not understand. So I asked, My Lord, what will the outcome of all this be? He replied, Go your way, Daniel, because the words are closed up and sealed until the end of time. Many will be purified, made spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. From the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be... Uh, 1,290 days. Blessed is the one who waits for and reaches to the end of the 1,335 days. As for you, go your way till the end. You will rest, and then at the end of days, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. Okay, so 
Like I said, there's a lot of stuff that's kind of going on here, but he, he, this, believe it or not, this is a summation of the things that we've already discussed to an extent. But we do get a little bit more additional information, specifically where the church fits into this. Right, This angel is giving these words to Daniel, and it's supposed to be an encouragement to him. So he does highlight the things that he's talking about. He does highlight the, the contents of the prophecy that was previously discussed. And then at the end of it, he goes, but remember your inheritance. right? And so as we look at that, keep that that in mind, right? The, the, the purpose of this message to Daniel, at least the latter part of this message, was really to be encouraging to him, even though it was probably confusing to him. Uh, so we look at 36 where we started reading, and it describes a king, right? It says the king will do these things, and it goes on to describe some of the characteristics of the king, some of the attributes of the king, and some of the quote-unquote accomplishments of the king. Um, and the idea here, uh, when the angel is talking to Daniel, is that this is where that shift happens from, from history, or right around this time, likely. It happens from history, which is previously in chapter 11, to prophecy. Uh, and he begins talking about what is likely considered the Antichrist. Right, So he's giving descriptors of the Antichrist. He's giving um, characteristics of the Antichrist. And we can compare that to what uh, latter verses in Revelation, which we'll do here shortly, that, that helps us understand what the context is here. He talks about a significantly distressing time for Israel. And he's framing it in the context of, of the end times, right? The Antichrist will be here, and, and, and the time of distress will be the time, times, and half a time, which is a reference to the last half of the tribulation. Again, we'll get to those things. But let's turn to um, Revelations chapter 13, and we'll read through that uh, a little bit of that together. Okay, so as we read through some of these things, um, keep that in mind in the context of what we read in 36, uh, chapter 11, verse 36, when he's talking about the kings. Um, 13, verse 1, And I saw a beast coming out of the sea. He had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on his horns, and each, had a, each head had a blasphemous name. Now, we've actually spent a good deal of time in this verse previously. You probably don't remember because that was like two years ago. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, but we talked about uh, what he's talking about here with the ten horns because there's the same reference to that in Daniel uh, previously in chapter uh, seven and, and chapter ten, right? But what he's talking about is this ten nation confederation that the Antichrist would likely emerge from, and he's giving us a lot of context. That's a whole study in and of itself, right? Um, but when he's talking about the beast coming out of the sea, many times when you hear the phrase the sea or out of the sea in regards to prophecy, it's almost literally never the sea. Usually what we're talking about here is the sea of humanity, right? And so it's saying the Antichrist is going to emerge from the sea of humanity. He's going to be a man. He's going to be a natural man. He's not going to be some mythical being that's going to be summoned into this world, right? He's going to be a man, and this man is going to be given power that is beyond him, and we'll see where, right? The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but he had a feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon, which is a reference to Satan, the dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have fought a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was astonished and followed the beast. Men worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast and they also worshipped the beast and asked who is like the beast who can make war against him the beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for 42 months he opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven he was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them and he was given authority over every tribe people language and nation all inhabitants of, all inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast and those whose names have not been written in the book of life belonging to the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world and then we jump down to 15 here briefly uh, and it says he was given again talking about the beast he was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that he could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed 
right? So there's a lot of things going on here, a lot of descriptors going on, and, and like I said, it's a whole separate study. But what we're looking at, what we're given here, is this image of the Antichrist, and we compare it to what we see here in Daniel chapter 30, or Jan, Daniel chapter 11, verse 36, and we see similarities that lead us to believe that it's likely talking about the Antichrist here, right? Uh, the king will do as he pleases. This this individual is exceptionally uh, proud and not in a good way, right? I mean, prideful in the sense that he exalts himself. And it, when, it, when it says he exalts himself, what we're talking about here is setting up a religion, right? He's setting up a religion that exalts himself and exalts Satan. We saw that uh, in verse uh, in chapter 13 of Revelations as well, right? Uh, and he magnified himself above every god and will say unheard things against the god of gods. He will be incredibly blasphemous, right? To the point where people would notice that and it would stand out about him. So he's going to speak out against the true God, uh, but he's also at the same time going to set up a religion for himself, right? He will be successful until the time of wrath is complete. That time of wrath is also mentioned in Jan Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, which is the time of distress. And it's mentioned again in Daniel chapter, uh, later on in chapter 12, where it's talking about the times, times, and half a time. Right? So it's, it's framing the context here, which is the tribulation. So he's given that power. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed. So until the tribulation is completed. He's going to have a, a time here on earth where he is going to be able to do powerful things. And he's going to be able to affect humanity, right? Both believers and non-believers. For what has been determined must take place. He will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or the one for the one desired by women. Here's an interesting tidbit that we get about the Antichrist, right? The, those two phrases that we see there, um, he will show no regard for the gods of his father. Some translations actually say God of his father. Either way, it's technically correct because the word that's being used there is Elohim. And that same word is the word that is used to describe God in Genesis 1.1, right? Elohim. And the reason that that is accurate is because Elohim, that word, by nature, is a word of plurality, right? And, and it can be used accurately to describe God because of the Holy Trinity, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so we can use that word accurately to describe God, but it can also be used in context to describe God's, lowercase g. But what it shows us here when he's saying that, where he's saying God's of his father or God of his father, what that is is a Jewish idiom. Right. That's a Jewish phrase that's used to describe the one true God. Right. The God of Abraham, Isaac and Joseph. Right. The God of their fathers. This is a context. This is a phrase that we've seen time and time again. And it's a known Jewish idiom. And it's the same thing here for the one desired by women. Again, another Jewish idiom. The one desired by women is a reference to how uh, Jewish women would be would are, are the ones desiring to bring forth the Messiah into this world. Right. And so the one desired by women is that is that phrase specific to Jewish women. And both of those are very, very Jewish in nature, Jewish in tradition, which leads us to believe to a certain extent that the Antichrist may come from Jewish heritage. Right. He will not be a traditional practicing Jew. Right. He will he will not be a religious man in the sense that he's worshiping God, but he will have the he may have the bloodline of Jews. Right. And so that's something else that we see here in, in regards to Daniel or, or, or in regards to this angel sharing with Daniel, which is getting passed down to us. Right. Uh, the other thing that we see in the latter part here, verse uh, 36 through uh, 39, really. Instead of them, he will honor a god of fortresses, a god unknown to his father. He will honor gold and silver. So it's talking about god of fortresses and a god unknown to his fathers of gold and silver. Right? So the Antichrist, so far we've kind of looked at it, the Antichrist will reject God and set up his own religion. He will set up his own religion in the, in the sense that those who don't worship him will be actively persecuted. So he's going to seek to set up his own religion and dominate those that don't practice that religion. Right? Uh, he, he's likely from Jewish uh, background or Jewish heritage. And then here we see that he's going to have a certain military might and a certain amount of wealth. And we know from elsewhere in scripture that he's going to be politically and, and charismatically savvy, right? He's going to be um, appealing to the human culture, right? People are going to respond to him. Um, and he's going to have a lot of wealth, and he's going to use that wealth and that military power 
to, to unite the world, again, through that ten-nation confederation that we see. And we've seen it, uh, we talked about it previously in Daniel, where that, that sort of emerges into, uh, that ten-nation confederation emerges into the Antichrist. And what that likely signifies is that at, at some point, Right, this world at large is going to be going towards a one-world government supported by a one-world economy, so that those things can be uh, easily dominated by by one person, really. Um, and historically speaking, you can't really argue with that trend. More and more, the way that information travels, the way that military might is translated. Um, we are we are leaning towards a one world government right and and even if you just look at it in general political stances you can't really argue with that right people uh, i say people but politicians in general tend to be more open to one world type governments with nations working hand in hand and not necessarily standing up for themselves um, which is fine on some social fronts but at the end of the day right it, it, the general attitude is that most likely there will be a one world government and it's going to be encouraged and brought on by the people of the world right and it's going to be supported by a one world uh, um, economy right and then verse 39 he will attack the mightiest fortresses with the help of a foreign god so again we're speaking to military might and will greatly honor those who acknowledge him he will make them rulers over many people and will distribute the land at a price so he's going to establish a domination here, and then he's going to spread out his, his power amongst the people to better uh, dominate the world as we know it at this time, right? And then verse 40 through 45, we're going to, we talked a little bit about this last time uh, in Daniel chapter 11, so we're going to move through this pretty quickly. But this is talking about the conflict that would happen at the end of time, right? We don't necessarily know who all these parties are. Um, again, we talked about uh, a little bit about it last time, what, you know, if Russia would be players in this. If um, you know Arabs would be a players in this, and, and how they fit Arabs being the, the geolocation, right? Um, and how they fit into this, but but it's this idea being communicated here is that there will be great conflict, and it will be internal conflict uh, against the Antichrist, and then ultimately there will be you know um, uh, domination and and victory by the Lord. Right by Jesus. At the end of the at the end of the king of the south will engage him in battle, and the king of the north will storm out against him with chariots and cavalry and a great fleet of ships. He will invade many countries and sweep through them like a flood. Again, talking about lots of military conflict that's going to be happening here. He will also invade the beautiful land. Many countries will fall, but Edom, Moab, and the leaders of Ammon will be delivered from his hand. He will extend his power over many countries. Egypt will not escape. He will gain control of the treasuries of gold and silver and all the riches of Egypt. Again, talking about financial domination here. With the Libyans and Nubians in submission. But reports from the east and the north will alarm him, and he will set out in a great rage to destroy and annihilate many. He will pitch his royal tents between the seas at the beautiful holy mountain, yet he will come to his end and no one will help him. Right, so we're talking about what's leading up to the Battle of Armageddon here, and it's talking about the conflict at the end of his reign that would emerge from that. And unfortunately, we look at this and we can have some good ideas about who the king of the north is and the king of the south is and who these uh, parties are. And we talked a little bit about that last time, but we really don't know. Right? We have some good ideas. We think Russia will be a major player in that in regards to the king of the north. And we see references to bears, which is, again, a very Russian thing, uh, Russian iconology. There's different things like that. Um, and we see uh, different countries around the Arab Peninsula that will likely take place. But the way that we see the world now doesn't necessarily reflect what the shape of the world will be in when we look at it. So when they talk about specific countries, we have to think of geolocation and not necessarily the borders as we know them now. right? But it's talking about this conflict that will lead up, ultimately, to the battle in the Promised Land, right? and then the, the victory that we see here in Jesus. Yet, yet he will come to his end and no one will help him. Right? And that's talking about the total victory that Jesus will have over him. And now we can actually get into Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Um, it, it starts here and it says, At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. I always think it's interesting here that uh, this angel, this, this vision and the interpretation that follows it goes from giving us some pretty significant heavy descriptors about... 
about the Antichrist and about the things that he will do and about, about the power that he will exhort here on this earth. And it does tell us about Jesus' victory over him. And then it jumps into describing Mar- Michael, which is the archangel, um, the archangel that's previously mentioned you know, throughout Scripture and, and one of the protectors of, of Israel. Um, and really, it's interesting. There's a theory out there that it's, it's proposed this way because the real counterpart to the Antichrist is could be could be uh, the Archangel Michael, right? And he's not the one that defeats him. The one that defeats him is Jesus. But it reminds us and it puts us in context who the powers at play are, right? And if we remember Satan. We tend to think of Satan as this, this, this powerful being that's equal to God in some context, like we put it out there. But we have to remember who Satan was in regards to the hierarchy of the, the throne in heaven, right? He was an angel, right? And he was a lead angel, right? And he's a fallen angel. And so we see Michael in this juxtaposition, this place, and, and it's almost like he's put there as a counterpoint to, we don't want to read into it too much, but he's almost like he's put there as a counterpoint to what we see and what we've seen talking about in regards to the Antichrist, right? There will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, and I'm going to pause here one second, I'm sorry. So we're going to read through the first part of Daniel and then pause and then we'll get to the next part of Daniel. And the reason we're doing that is because the two actually go hand in hand. The first four verses of Daniel and the last, you know, five through 13 verses, uh, the last five verses, or the last five through 13 verses, right? are really putting emphasis on what was initially said by that angel. And so we're going to study both kind of in parallel. So we're going to read through this first part real quick. At that time, Michael, the great uh, prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress, distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of heaven, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, O Daniel, close up and seal the words of the scroll until the, end of the, until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. Sorry. Uh, and so... What, uh, what this angel does is sort of summarize some of the things that have been previously discussed. And when he summarizes those things, he goes on to reemphasize what he's talking about here, or not he, but God goes on to reemphasize through this sort of additional vision or uh, angels coming to, to stand before Daniel, right? And we read this last part. It was said, Then I, Daniel, looked, and there before me stood two others, one on this bank of the river and one on the opposite. And one of them said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, How long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? Right? So it's two angels having a conversation with each other, and Daniel's almost sort of a, a standing there witnessing that conversation. Conversation. And that conversation is really just a quick summation and emphasis on the points that were kind of previously discussed and given interpretations to by this Daniel, or by, by this angel here. Um, but the other thing to note here is this angel is is sort of in a, a position of miracles, right? He's in a position of, to be standing on the water, uh, which is comparable to what Jesus did, right, in the sense that it's not natural, it's something that, you know, is spiritually powered, um, and he's reaching his hands towards heaven. So it's going to something that would stand out to Daniel, even two people talking on, uh, to each other across the river, one of them is standing on the water and reaching towards heaven. So it's, it's, there's, even though he's going through a lot of information here, and sort of like drinking from a fire hydrant, right? He's getting all of this information. He's trying to understand it. This is something that would have stood out to him because it's well, it's an angel standing on water, right? I mean, it's... And so it's supposed to add emphasis to this conversation. It's supposed to get his attention. How long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? And these things that were previously mentioned here in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 through 4. And the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river lifted his right hand and his left hand towards the heaven. And I heard him swear by him who lives forever. It will be for a time, times, and half a time. That phrase right there is one that we've discussed previously. Again, it's another Jewish idiom. Um, But it's, it's... uh, the same thing that's talked about here in, in uh, chapter 1, or verse 1 of chapter 12, where it says the time of distress, 
And we just talked about it previously, the time of wrath, the time, times, and half a time, chapter 6 through chapter 13 or 18, you know, I mean, it's, it's most of it. But we, if we look at chapter 6, Revelations, it gives us a glimpse of some of the things that will happen during this time. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of seven seals, then I heard one of the four living creatures saying a voice like thunder, Come. I looked, and there before me was a white horse, its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. When the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come, and then another horse came out, fiery red. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other. To him was given a large sword. Then the lamb opened the third seal, and I heard the, living vo- the third living creature say, Come, and I looked, and there before me was a black horse, and his rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures say, uh, saying, A quart of wheat for a day's wages, and three quarts of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. When the Lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the fourth the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come, and I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death and Hades, and Hades was following close behind. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword and famine and plague and by the wild beasts of the earth. And when I opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of, souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud, out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, Lord holy and true until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge your blood. Then each of them was given a white robe and they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been completed. (laughs) Excuse me. So what we're looking at there, and this is just a a beginning, right? That's just a glimpse of what we're looking at. It goes on and on and on to describe the atrocities that would happen during the tribulation. And and we know that, right? The Antichrist is going to have power here, and he's going to do terrible things, and he's going to persecute believers specifically, and Israel is going to take the brunt of that, right? Um, And it's a terrible thing. There's going to be disease and famine and sickness and and death on a large scale, believers and non-believers, right? Um, But what we have to remember is not only did God allow this, but he, he brought this forth, right? And for what? What purpose? Why would these things be happening? And that's what we have to remember when we talk about the tribulation is it does indeed serve a purpose. And largely, there's a couple of points that we can bring forth, but some of the most notable points to discuss about it are um, is the fact that the tribulation is a wake-up call for non-believers, right? This is God reaching out to the earth and saying, wake up, look, look at how terrible things can be, right? And as terrible as things here on earth, you know, during the tribulation, that's got nothing on eternal damnation, right? And so he's going, wake up. And, and this isn't a new strategy, right? This isn't a new process that people are saved. Oftentimes when people are at the lowest of the low, that's when they reach out to God. It doesn't always happen. Sometimes people shake their fist and get angry and stubborn hearted. And it's a difficult thing. And there will still be people that do that during the tribulation. But there will also be those that are saved, right? We know that there's, there are those that are saved during the tribulation. Some of them are martyred even. Some of them make it towards the, the kingdom of God that will be set up at the end of the tribulation. All of us will be there eventually, right? But um, it's a terrible time, but it's one that has a purpose. It's to wake up the believers. Number two, it's really supposed to uh, wake up Israel. Israel is stubborn-hearted, Right? They are still looking for salvation. They are still looking for the Messiah at large and by traditional Jewish standards, right? They're still looking for the Messiah. And God is going, no, wake up. And we do know in Romans, Paul talks about it, they will wake up, right? This will be the time that they respond. Many will die. Many will be persecuted. Some will be stubborn, right? But the, the ones that survive will be saved, Right, and talks about the 144,000 and those fleeing into the hills. This is that time, right? And this is one of the purposes of the tribulation. And the other thing that it does is it really frames and defines the kingdom of God. As Christians now, we are used to be in the kingdom of God being open to us, right? We're used to the fact that we can approach God freely because that debt has been paid, right? By the blood of Jesus Christ. But at a certain point, When he comes back to set up that kingdom here on earth, that's it. It's done. Those who are saved will be saved, and those who are not saved 
will not be saved. So this is his last time. This is sort of his last call going, wake up. Things are bad. But as bad as they are now, I can save you. Right? Um, and so that's what he's showing us here in regards to the tribulation. It's heavy stuff. It's, it's hard when we look at it. And, and I can understand why Daniel would be so distressed when he's given the interpretation to this vision. There's a lot of information there. Right? Back to Daniel chapter 12. Uh, and he said, uh, middle of verse 7, I heard him swear by him who lives forever, saying it will be for a time, times, and half a time. Again, that phrase, that Jewish idiom, talking about the tribulation. And that compares to chapter one or chapter 12, verse 1, where it says, The time was distressed such as not happened before the beginning of nations until then. Those two run parallel. He's giving emphasis to that. This is what's happening, right? I heard, but I did not understand, said Daniel. I'm into that. So I asked, my Lord, what will the outcome of all of this be? And he replied, go your way, Daniel, because the words are closed up and sealed until the end of time. How about, I mean, talk about unsatisfactory answer, right? I'd be like, <laughs> really? That's what you've got for me after this is all said and done? Uh, but we have to be careful when we read that, right? Because that's the, we, we see that twice, right? Uh, verse 4, it says, But you, Daniel, close up and seal the words of the scroll until the end of time. So it's saying to seal them up there. And then we say here, verse 9, it says, Go your way, Daniel, because the words are closed up and be sealed until the end of time. Some people look at this and think it's inappropriate for us to be discussing prophecy because we're told to seal it up until the end of times and then it will sort of be self-evident and reveal itself. That's not what's, that's likely not what's true here. What, what's being talked about here is this idea to turn away from it, to stop your question, your mental questioning of this. And what he's telling Daniel what he's telling Daniel here is to turn away from it. Don't be obsessed with it, right? Um, to study it. There, there are things that Christians have gotten th from the scripture throughout the years that they study it, and there are things that Daniel got from it when he, when he was given to it. But to, to not be obsessed with it, right? It, this is for the end of times, and the end of times will, will take care of, of itself. That being said, we are still called to study and to be aware and to not be asleep, Right, and we see that in Matthew, uh, or Matthew, or Thess I think it's actually Thessalonians, when he's calling us and he's saying, "Don't be asleep, but but be awake and be alert to, to have knowledge, right? To know." Um, but this idea of being sealed is to say, "Hey, you know, there's a time for the church to focus on that, and that this isn't necessarily your time, right? Not that you shouldn't study it, not that you shouldn't be aware of it, but this isn't your time. This is." likely what's being told to Daniel here. Um, but there's an interesting phrase following that in verse 4 that says, many will go here and there to increase knowledge. Uh, some translations say to and fro. Uh, some people think this is a reference to the time of the end being linked tightly with the age of information, right? This idea that knowledge will move quickly uh, and it will, it will be something that is easily you know, and easily found and very prevalent. Um, at the same time, it could be talking about how people would just continually scour the scriptures, seeking information throughout the ages. We don't know, right? But it is an interesting thought process, right? Because when we look at, at, at this information, how information would be abundant, we are certainly in the time of the information age, right? I mean, we, information now is, is, moving and growing and doubling at a rate that is just astounding, right? Um, the, uh, the, uh, there was a study done called the knowledge, uh, the, um, the knowledge doubling curve, right? And, and this was done by Buckminster Fuller, and there was a guy that sort of did a commentary on it called David uh, Schilling. And, and there's some interesting ideas that were proposed, and again, I'm not a scientist, and I don't know the process of which they track this stuff. I don't even understand how you would. But the thought process was that uh, up until the 1900s, information doubled every, uh, every century, right? So every 100 years, the amount of global information, the amount of stuff that we knew doubled. By World War II, the doubling of information happened every 25 years, right? Uh, and this was written in 2013. At that time, they estimated the average human knowledge doubled every 13 months, 
right? So we're talking about a scale where, where it's just compounding and compounding and compounding about what we know. Uh, IBM even estimated that at that time, with the internet emerging, that, uh, that human knowledge on a grand scale, and I'm not talking about scientific or technology or anything like that, just general knowledge, they estimated that general knowledge could get to a point where it would double every 12 to 13 hours based off of the internet. Again, I don't know how you come up with that number, but I think the general idea here is that knowledge is much more prevalent now and the ability to learn things and to research things and to understand things because you compare them to other things is much more prevalent now than it used to be. Um, I'm a history major from George Mason University. I studied there. Uh, and it was interesting because you would get two types of professors there, right? You would get um, professors that were older and had a more traditional way of teaching history. And I, this isn't new, right? This is the same everywhere that you go. You get the tenured professors that do the things that they've done for the, you know, the past 40 years and they're not going to change. And then you get the younger student, you know, TAs or younger professors or younger teachers that get in there and, and are, are trying to cut their teeth and, um, and they had a little bit different perspective on the things that you were teaching us. This was particularly interesting in history because history has always been taught from this perspective that you had limited sources and you had to be able to study those sources, analyze those sources, and then be able to determine what happened and how that might apply to us, right, as we're studying it. Uh, but when I was going to school, the reality of what happened when you were assigned a research paper was not limited sources. There was an abundance of sources. It was everywhere. Pretty much any topic they gave you, you could find stuff on it, right? But you had to be able to determine what was true and what wasn't true which was significantly different than, than how the older teachers were teaching it. They were saying, hey, there's one newspaper clipping, good luck. You know, you tell me what you think happened. But, but what really was happening was, well, there's one newspaper clipping. Oh, no, they found another newspaper clipping. Oh, and now there's this book about it, and he was close to a single source that was writing it, so now he's got his perspective, and it says something completely different, right? But this idea that information is, is growing at a rate that is unbelievable, and it's true, right? I mean, we look at we look at how information was relayed in you know the time of King Solomon, right? It was on a horseback and messenger, and you look how information was relayed in the time of the War for Independence, and it was on horseback and messenger, right? And now all of a sudden we've got text messages and smartphones that significantly outclass the supercomputer from ten years ago. I mean, it's it's crazy. But so we're at this age. We're at this age where information is prevalent, and he's talking, and and Daniel is getting told, and he's saying, "Hey, you know, these are important words. These are true words, but don't be so focused on it." And David Guzak, who write, who does a lot of commentaries and Bible studies, uh, has an interesting perspective in regards to the age of the churches and how those are focused. And I'm going to read directly from him because I do think it's relevant. He says, for example, in the 2nd through 4th centuries, the church focused on the doctrine of Scripture. In the 4th century, the focus was on the doctrine of God in the Trinity. In the 5th century, the focus was on the doctrine of Christ. In the 5th through 7th century, the focus was on the doctrine of man. In the 15th and 17th centuries, the focus was on the doctrine of salvation. In the 16th and 17th centuries, the focus was on the doctrine of the church. So it, no, so it should not surprise us that it was not until the 19th and 20th centuries, possibly the time of the end, he's got that in bold, right, that the focus would turn up the doctrine of the last things and the return of Jesus, right? And so... We don't know. I'm not standing here before you to tell you when the, when the tribulation is going to happen and when the rapture is going to happen. But we, we can look at what's been given to us prophetically speaking and the knowledge that's given to us now. And there's, there's not a whole lot left that has to happen prophetically speaking before the rapture has to, it will occur. Right? And so in all reality, we are likely in that time of the end. Right? And that's why there's been so much studies done on prophecies lately and it's it's not just us and it's not just me looking at daniel if you look at the history of the church there is a pretty significant focus on prophecies and end times lately right um but that's a good thing that's so that we can learn and we can grow right uh but verse 9 of chapter 12 he replied 
Uh, go your way, Daniel, because the words are closed up and sealed until the end of time. Many will be purified, made spotless, and refined. Again, we know that this is a prophecy for Daniel because that level of purification that he's talking about there is, can only be had through Jesus Christ, right? And so this is all this is all future for him for us some of that is past we can see that level of purification now right Uh, many will be purified made spotless and refined not that to be clear not that people can be saved before jesus christ but that phrase purification is often associated with the sacrifice and blood of jesus christ right many purified made spotless and refined but the wicked will continue to be wicked none of the wicked will understand but those who will arise will understand Verse 11, from, that time, from the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. Blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of the 1,335 days. Here's what's interesting. This is a very, very specific prophecy. It's got numbers that are specific to the abomination of the desolation, which is halfway through the tribulation. Right, so it's talking about here, which is, and I mentioned this before, the time, times, and half time is referred to also as 1260 days. If you look at that, 1290 days, so it's saying that the time, times, and half time, 30 days after that, right, uh, something will happen at 1290 days. And I hate to be so vague, but that's all we know, right? It's, it's incredibly specific. But we don't know what's going to happen at 1290 days, right? Uh, And the blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of 1,335 days. The common thought process here is that what we're looking at is the end of the tribulation at 1260 days. Jesus returns, right? And when Jesus returns, he goes to set up and install his kingdom which is probably what happens at 1290 days, 1290 days. Uh, and then at the, after that, it's an additional 45 days. And during that time, uh, we know from Scripture that God will set up his kingdom and then he will judge the nations. And so the best thought process there is that we have the time for installing and setting up the kingdom and then the time for judging the nations. We don't really know, but that's probably what we're looking at here. Uh, Verse 13, as for you, go your way till the end. You will rest, and at the end of the days you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. So we've been through a lot. We've talked a lot about the tribulation and the Antichrist. But the meat of this message uh, and the, the message that Daniel was left with was one of hope, right? And he says, uh, as, for, as for you, go your way until the end. You will rest. And, <laughs> excuse me. At the end of the days, you will receive your allotted inheritance. What he's talking about there, we can look back here in verse 1. Right? It says there will be the time of distress. But at that time, the people that your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will, be, will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. What he's saying is that there's, there's hope for Christians. There's a rescue plan for, for I say Christians, for believers, right? There's a rescue, rescue plan for believers. And he's saying, don't forget about that. And that rescue plan that he's talking about is likely the rapture, right? It's pretty straightforward. You can look at verse 2, and there's some theories that say the multitude who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life and others to everlasting contempt. Some apply that specifically to Israel, saying some will uh, arise and awaken and be saved, and others will die in contempt and shame. The plainest and simplest explanation is talking about bodily resurrection here. And so what we know about bodily bodily resurrection is that those who die in Christ, their soul goes to heaven. And during the rapture, our soul is reunited and given a glorified body, right? And so what we're looking at here is likely a description of the rapture, likely likely a description of, of what will happen to us as a church during these times, right? And it's supposed to be a hopeful message. He's saying, but at that time, your people, everyone whose name is written in the book, he's talking about the book of life, and we'll talk about here that in a second, will be delivered. Right? We're going to be, we're going to be snatched up. Harpazo, right? That's the, that's the, the, the original word for it. The Latin translation for that is like raptus. I didn't write it down as raptus, I think, right? Rapture. Um, but, but we see this idea that we will be snatched up and saved and the, the days of the tribulation will be shortened for us. We see that again in, in Matthew 24, if you want to turn there with me. Matthew 24, verse 21.
All right, Matthew 24, verse 21. For then there will be great distress. Again, the same language that we see here in Daniel chapter one or chapter twelve, verse one. Great distress, great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now. And this is Jesus talking, and never to be equaled. For those days had, if for, I'm sorry, if those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. All right. So he's talking about this idea that the elect, those that are saved. Those that are in the blood of Jesus Christ, those those days will be shortened, right? And people can have disagreements on those, this this principle, and people can have biblical disagreements on this principle. But the general understanding seems to be that the rapture will happen for us before the 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 majority of the tribulation takes place, right? This is this the church will be snatched up before that. We will be given our glorified bodies and then we will come back down during the kingdom of the of the millennium right and 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 be with jesus down here right before the the final uh before the final thing happens right um and we see this again if we go to first thessalonians verse 4 uh 16 through 18 and i can read this for you guys for the lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command with the voice of the archangel with the trumpet call of god and the dead in christ will arise for that if after that we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together caught up that's harpazo caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the lord in the air he's describing this process of receiving our glorified body and so we will be with the lord forever All right this idea that those who have died will receive their body and those who are alive right those are there are some there's a generation of christians of believers that will not die right right they will they will be caught up and receive their glorified body on the way up right and that's what he's saying here to us and he's saying that those who have, are found in the book of life will will be eligible for this deliverance will be eligible for this rescue and those who are not will not right they will have to go through the tribulation it is possible we do know people that will get saved during the tribulation because people will be martyred during the tribulation right like i said it's that last ditch effort to waken people up but as a church we have a way out of that right we have a hope and even if the timing is wrong right even if we debate on the timing and some people think it happens later or earlier even if the timing is wrong we do know that ultimately god will rescue us right there's a, there's a rescue plan for us as a church even at the end of that because those believers that are martyred in the in the tribulation will be saved right they're going to be saved they're going to be there with us we can also look in regards to the book of life uh, uh revelations chapter 21 this is encouraging to those who are found in the book of life and discouraging to those that are not sure or maybe stubborn against it right 21 verses 22 through 27. <laughs> Sorry. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor onto it. On one day will its gates, uh, on no day will its gates ever be shut. For there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will enter in it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Right? We have an opportunity now as, as believers to get into it. And as believers, we've taken that opportunity. And we have, we have an opportunity to bring others with us. Right? Uh, Revelations uh, chapter 20 verses 11 through 15 we see it again then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it earth and sky fled from his presence and there was no place for them and I saw the dead great and small standing before the throne and books were open another book was opened which was the book of life the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books the sea gave up the dead that were in it and death and hades gave up the dead that were in them and each person was judged according to what he had done then death and hades were thrown into the lake of fire the lake of fire is the second death if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life he was thrown into the lake of fire so we see some things here in 
in regards to the book of life. But really, ultimately, it should be encouraging, right? That's what he says in, in, in Matthew, right? Use these words to encourage one another, right? And so it's this idea of like, hey, we have a rescue plan. We, it's been thought out for us. It's been determined for us. Our names are written in the book of life, and we are saved as believers. But above that, right, it says at the end of Daniel, it says, uh, you will rest, and at the end of the days, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance, that's beautiful, right? But what we need to see here uh, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 3, it says, Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heaven, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So it's not enough just to be saved. That is the rescue plan, right? That is the, the culmination of the rescue plan and deliverance that God has given us, right? But we are called to do more than that as believers, right? And we are called to lead those around us into that same rescue plan and that deliverance, right? So we can't just stop here and be satisfied with our salvation. It's a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing, right? And you, I mean, that, that is all you need for salvation is the blood of Jesus. But we are called to do more than that as believers, right? Which is to reach out to those around us, those who are lost, and to try and lead them into righteousness, right? And they will look to be looked upon favorably here. So as we wrap up, and we're talking about the book of life here, there was a comparison that I've uh, heard years back, uh, and it was actually by my old pastor uh, back in Virginia, so I'm going to steal it blatantly from him, right? But uh, the, com the comparison that he was talking about in regards to the book of life, I found particularly moving, right? Um, what was it, 100 plus years back, like 1912, uh, was the disaster of the Titanic, right? And the Titanic was the, the height of human science and technology. People bought these uh, tickets. They went on, uh, on the passage, and it sank. And thousands of lives, lives were lost, right? I mean, there's, there's some debate exactly because we don't know. The roster wasn't accurate. You know, anywhere from 1,200 to 2,000 or something like that. Uh, but this wasn't the information age. People didn't know who was lost and who was not lost, who was drowned and who survived. Uh, for many families, one of the quickest, in fact, sometimes the only way to figure out who was drowned and not drowned was days after, right? They had to, they had to make their way to the White Star Line, which was the owner of the, the Titanic. They had to make their way to the White Star Line company in Liverpool, England. And they had to stand and wait as somebody wrote on a big chalkboard, right? And then there were two sides to that chalkboard, which is known to be lost and known to be found. Right, and they had to stand there and wait as these names, and and they had to look and see where their loved one ended up on that, right? And it's, I mean, it's it's crazy to sit there and imagine what that would look like. As believers, we know where we're at, right? But what about the loved ones or our friends or our family? I mean, if that natural disaster happened and we had to be stand there and looking at that chalkboard waiting for someone we loved to be saved or to show up on that list, how hard would we be praying, right? We go, God, please don't let them be on the lost. Please let them be on the found, right? And that's, that's the same earnesty that we as believers should be praying for those around us, right? Please don't let them be on the lost. Let them be on the found, right? I'm glad that we are on the found, right? So anyway, that's what I want to close with. That's what I want you guys thinking about. Let's pray, Lord. And let's, let's thank God where we are. And let's remember to, to pray with earnest and to, to act with earnesty for those that are lost around us. Lord, thank you for this time that we have before you. Thank you that we can learn these things, that you give us insight to the end times. And even as we struggle to understand all aspects of it, we do know that things are clear, right? We know that your, your punishment and your justice will be exhibited here on earth, and we know as believers and as a church, as the, as the body of believers, that we will be rescued, Lord, that you have a plan for us, that our names are written in the book of life. Lord, and we rejoice for that. We are thankful for that. We praise you for that. And I pray as a church, as a body of believers, that we can be praying for those that we don't know about. Where will the name show up? Some may know and are, are, and are praying earnestly, and I pray that you encourage them to continue to pray earnestly, Lord. Some may not know, 
and may not be praying, Lord. And I pray that you encourage them to, to start praying and to pray with earnesty, Lord. We love you and we, we're thankful for your grace and your, your love and the blood that sanctified us, Lord. Amen.